Hello and welcome to Truth or Myth. In today's episode, we're taking a fun and fast look at the mistakes made in the first five episodes of season two of Star Trek The Next Generation. Just a reminder, if you want to explain away any of the mistakes, then it has to be with an in-universe canon explanation. So no novels, video games, tech manuals, and or your great uncle Fred's sixth pet goldfish are valid sources to explain away the mistakes. And so, with all that out of the way, let's begin. So this is the premiere episode of the second season of TNG. And well, I can't stand it. At the beginning of this episode, we get a shot of a shuttlecraft, leaving what we find out to be is Shuttle Bay 3. The problem here is that Shuttle Bay 3 is one of the lower shuttle bays on the neck of the Enterprise D. From that position of departure, we, the audience, should see clearly visible the top of an engine nacelle. Unfortunately, the nacelle is nowhere to be found. When Hesterdell, the Odette 9 scientist, beams aboard the Enterprise, he spends several hours inspecting the module before allowing the specimens to be beamed aboard. This serves to convey the danger to the audience of the mission that the Enterprise is on. However, at the end of this episode, the Enterprise immediately begins beaming the specimens down, right after they beam Hesterdell down. Data? You can lock onto the first group and begin transporting on my mark. Does this seem right? Shouldn't Hesterdale take a few hours to inspect the modules at the receiving end? When Picard and Wesley ride the turbolift together, watch Wesley Crusher. Just before they exit onto Deck 10, Wesley's arms are at his side. But in the next shot, suddenly, his arms are crossed. Watch the shot where Wesley is gazing outside from 10 forward. In the first shot, we see Wesley's pensive face and the starfield reflected in the windows of the ship's lounge. However, in the next shot over Wesley's shoulder, we can clearly see the planet the Enterprise is orbiting. So why wasn't this planet being reflected in the window? Besides this, 10 forward is at the front of the ship, hence the name 10 forward. So, in order for Wesley to be gazing at the planet as we see it, the ship would need to be facing it, which it is not. So when the plasma specimens the Enterprise is carrying suddenly begins to grow, the crew of the Enterprise-D are thrown into a panic and discuss what options they have of getting rid of the growing danger. Riker suggests jettisoning the module, but the scientist from ODET-9 says no and gives the reason for this as whoever encounters it later will be destroyed. Data, prepare to jettison the module. We can't do that either. It will go into a spore and remain until it comes into contact with a planet or another ship, and the results would be disastrous. Logical, right? Well, no, not in the slightest. Why doesn't the Enterprise simply fly by a sun and jettison the module right into it? Would it not be incinerated? And wouldn't it be likely most starships wouldn't be hanging out in a sun anyhow if the sample survived the incineration? I know someone out there will want to bring up metaphasic shielding. You know, the shields that allow the Enterprise D to travel inside a sun in Descent Part 2? But remember, at this point, neither Starfleet nor anyone else has that capability. And such a thing seems to be an impossibility, as the original episode's suspicions suggest. Or they could even beam the module out as energy only, as seen in episodes such as TOS's episode Wolf in the Fold, or TNG's episode Lonely Among Us. At the beginning of this episode, Riker asks Data if there are any records of any ships encountering a phenomenon like the hole in space they were observing. Data, is there any record anywhere of any occurrence even vaguely similar to this? Accessing. Negative, sir. There is no record of any Federation vessel encountering anything remotely like this. Data should brush up on his Starfleet history. What about the hole in space encountered by the TOS crew in the Immunity Syndrome? Perhaps an interstellar 
Dust the cloud. Not a very likely answer. No? You'd be able to see stars through a dust cloud. Looks like a hole in space. Would this not qualify as something that should be mentioned? Watch Picard and Riker during the scene where Data is trying to hail the USS Yamato. Riker is standing close to the main view screen, with Picard further back. However, in the next shot, suddenly, Picard and Riker are almost standing side by side. Then, the shot after that, suddenly, they're far apart again. Not really a mistake per se, but simply something done for the sake of the plot. During this episode, Nagilam appears and ends up killing an ensign sitting at the helm. To the audience's dismay, however, the ensign is not Wesley Crusher. But shut up, Wesley! I guess it was just a stroke of luck that even though he always seems to be on the bridge in season two on, Wesley just happens to be on break at this very moment. And another oddity that really isn't a mistake, but bears mentioning, is that shortly after Nagilam reveals himself to the crew, he starts commenting about how some humanoids are constructed differently, referring to the females on board. What are you? Our construction also differs. Then he spins Pulaski around a few times, and that's that. Doesn't it seem a bit odd he chose Pulaski as his demo subject? especially given that the busting out all over Troy is nearby. It looks like the auto-destruct function has changed. In this episode, when Picard and Riker initiate the auto-destruct, they're asked for a time frame and choose 20 minutes. So Starfleet must have changed it sometime after the episode 11001001. In that episode, Picard and Riker discuss how the time interval is fixed at only five minutes. Okay, so this episode raises a lot of issues for me. First, how with one simple line could a non-conscious computer system create a conscious being on the holodeck? Computer, in the Holmesian style, create a mystery to confound data with an opponent who has the ability to defeat it. That would imply the computer itself had consciousness, and that is not something supported by the series at all. Second, if Moriarty is conscious, then we may have an equal rights situation here and someone should inform Starfleet's HR right away. In Measure of a Man, Picard lays out the three indicators for a being required to have equal rights. Commander, would you enlighten us? What is required for sentience? Intelligence. Self-awareness? Consciousness? Well, we see Moriarty is intelligent. After all, he takes over the main computer on the Enterprise and plans an elaborate plot. We also know he has consciousness, as Data says so, and Troy backs us up with her empathic senses. Something she can't do for even Data, and he's sentient. In programming Moriarty to defeat me, not Holmes, he had to be able to acquire something which I possess. What exactly? Consciousness, sir. Captain, I'm sensing something from the holodeck. It's as if a unifying force or a single consciousness is trying to bring it all into focus. So the third criteria is self-awareness. Is Moriarty self-aware? He sure seems to be to me. I, I feel like a new man. I need information. I have read her expressions. Is the definition of life cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am? You or someone asked your computer to program a nefarious fictional character from 19th century London, and that is how I arrived. But I am no longer that creation. I am no longer that evil character. I have changed. So then wouldn't shutting him down constitute a violation of his rights? And if the main computer can generate or create a sentient life form, does that imply the main computer might be sentient itself? Wouldn't a study into these factors, or at least a discussion, seem appropriate here? So, another holodeck episode here, and as such, certain things bear mentioning, such as how some matter can leave the holodeck in some episodes, and in others, they simply cannot. Even Picard explaining the situation at the end of the episode to Moriarty 
explains that holodeck matter cannot leave the holodeck, yet scenes earlier we know it did. Star Trek always plays fast and loose when it comes to these points in holodeck history. Watch the inspector in the scene where the murder has occurred. In one shot, the good inspector kneels down and rests his right hand on his right knee. In the next shot, however, his right arm rests on his right knee. Okay, another episode I have a problem with. But this one because of the episode title itself. Through this whole episode, everyone marvels at how outrageous this guy is. And yet, nothing he does is outrageous at all. After all, most of the things he does is Riker's regular Tuesday night. And no one calls him outrageous. Okay, so this is a bit of a picky one, but hey, that's what I'm here for. Watch when Worf is sent to retrieve Okana. He finds him in a female's quarters. The numbers to the left of the door indicate that they are on deck 7. However, when they walk to the turbo lift, the numbers there indicate they are on deck 11. Someone made a mistake here. Watch Dr. Pulaski's magical disappearing act in this episode. After retrieving Riva and his party, Riker, who's in command, has Ensign Crusher set a course for Seleus V. Riker is in the captain's chair, and Pulaski is beside him in Troy's chair. In the first shot, she's looking at Riker, and then in the next, suddenly she's looking at Troy's terminal. But that's not the big issue here. Next, we see the Enterprise blast out of orbit for all of about two seconds, and then in the next shot of the bridge, suddenly, Pulaski's gone. When the Enterprise reaches Soleus V, Worf tells the bridge crew that he detects laser activity. Captain, I'm reading laser activity on Soleus V. To this information, Picard tells the planet that they must stop all this nonsense or the Enterprise will withdraw, since Picard won't put his ship at risk. If you continue to violate the ceasefire, I will abort this mission. Reva is in charge of the summit. I command the ship that brings him. I will not endanger this ship under any circumstances. What happened to lasers not even being able to penetrate the navigational shields? See the previous episode, The Outrageous Okana. They are now locking lasers on us. Lasers? Yes, sir. Lasers can't even penetrate our navigation shields. Don't they know that? And reduce speed. Drop main shields as well. May I ask why, sir? In case we decide to surrender to them, number one. Thank you for watching today's episode of Truth or Myth. Have an explanation for any of the mistakes I've listed here? Or do you see one I've missed? Well, leave a comment in the section below. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, hitting that little bell icon so you won't miss a single video we release. Want to help the channel out correcting its own mistakes? Then become a channel patron. The link to our Patreon account is in the description below. Thanks again for watching. Live long and prosper.